Good morning. There we go. Yes, that's right. I heard somebody wooing back there. Hey, we're glad you're here. Just want to take a moment and welcome each of you and just say we're glad you're here. Uh, if you're joining us online, I want to say a welcome to you as well. If you're visiting with us, if you're our guest today, we would love to know uh, that you're with us today. And if you would just take a moment and you received a little handout when you came in, and there's a connection card in that handout. Uh, our, our people kind of use that for sign me up types of things or for prayer requests, uh, things like that. Uh, we just ask that you take a moment, fill that out for us, 
And on your way out uh, the door today, on your way as you're leaving, you can drop that off in a couple of places. Uh, one, you can either drop it off in the giving center. We have a wood box over there. Also, we have a table set up in the cafe area. It's called our Connection Center. And you can drop that card there. That Connection Center is also a great way for you to be able to connect with somebody if you want to know a little bit more about what's going on uh, in the life of our church. If you're wanting to get involved in some things and, and uh, like small groups or serving opportunities, things like that, or just want to know a little bit more about who we are as a church, that's a great place for you to connect uh, with, uh, with someone there. So I invite you to do that as well. Uh, in the cafe, there's always going to be coffee, bagels, donuts, and th good things like that. Feel free to bring something in today and just worship with us as you feel God uh, leading your worship. Our prayer is always that you will experience God today in the fullest and that you've come prepared and your hearts are prepared to experience him as we worship him in song, as the band does a great job of leading us in that, and as we open God's word and see what God has to say for us uh, through his word. Go ahead and stand with me if you would. We're getting ready to, uh, we're, we're continuing our series called Stand Your Ground. In the last several weeks, we've been camped out in Ephesians chapter 6, as Paul has talked about the armor of God and how we're supposed to put that armor on, not just because we might occasionally need it, but because we are constantly in battle with this unseen enemy. Uh, and so we're going to take time to read that scripture together. I just want everyone to stand as we read that scripture. And if you'll go ahead and put that up on the screens, Cliff, we'll read that. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Pray also for me, that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me, so that I, may, I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly, as I should. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word today. May you experience God's word to the fullest. Go ahead and take a moment to greet somebody.
We fill the open skies with the sound of your praises.
things to one another and to God uh, the last few minutes. Uh, now it's appropriate for us to talk directly to God through prayer. So let's just bow our hearts, bow our heads, and uh, you know, I'm just going to guide us in a moment or two here uh, of talking to God and just sharing our hearts with Him. And right now, some of you have uh, had just great weeks. You just experienced great things this past week. Why don't you take a moment just to say, God, thank you for dot, dot, dot. And others have had struggles, had trials. We've had some, some terrible things maybe occur. And right now would be an appropriate time to say, God, I need your touch in this area. Just silently to yourself, to your God, name that area to him. Declare that area right now. He knows it already, but 
But there's power in you agreeing with God in this area, saying, God, help me, touch me in this, my work life, my family life, in a personal area. Would you invite God right now to speak to you during this time as we open up his word and as we look at what it says to us? Father, we ask that your spirit would speak a clear message to our hearts and to our minds today, whether we are gathered here on this campus in this physical location or we're somewhere throughout the rest of the world on our iCampus today. Would your spirit just penetrate through the noise and through the confusion and through the clutter and speak a clear word to us? In Christ's powerful name, amen. Hey, it's good to see you all. I invite you to open up your Bibles. And uh, of course, I'm not telling you where to open them up yet. So just, I guess, hold your Bible. There you go. Hold your Bible if you have it. We're, we're uh, looking, we're continuing on our, our time as we look at, at the idea of standing our ground. I love what Pastor John said. It's not the idea, it's not the concept of if the enemy comes at you. It's not the idea that there might be one time in your life that you're undergoing some kind of spiritual assault. The reality is, is uh, we live in a world uh, that is fraught with, with spiritual aggression. We live in a world in which if you're walking today, if you're breathing today, then I guarantee you at some point, uh, and it's going to be quite often, you're going to undergo spiritual attack. Uh, Pastor Mike, back when we started this series, Use that. Uh, use a great metaphor, and I think it applies here too. Remember, he he showed that spectrum of all the different things that bounce at us. You know, whether they're light rays or, uh, or light waves or or X rays or photons and all the stuff that just comes from the outer space and how it's bombarding us. And the reality is, is is if we could look at the full spectrum of all these different. Uh, waves, whether they be radio waves or uh, you know television waves, whatever microwaves, whatever the waves are, whatever the spectrum is, if we look at this full spectrum. We are being bombarded with with a, a constant assault, but we never know. In the same way, I would argue that there is usually quite a high degree of frequency in which we are under attack, but we've grown used to it, or we just say, "Well, that's just the way it is. That's just part of living on planet Earth." And so you get used to it, and you don't realize the spiritual dimension that's happening at this point or at that point in your life, and so you just really don't uh, pay attention to it. And today, as we think about the enemy attacking us, we're talking about the helmet of salvation. And I find it very interesting that Paul uh, uses this metaphor in speaking on the idea of putting a helmet on to protect your head. I don't believe that metaphor. I don't believe that illustration was an accident for Paul. I think he was very, or I know, I know he was very specific in saying, hey, there, uh, when it go, comes to spiritual attack, it's important to guard our mind. It's important to guard our thought process and what's going on inside of our brain. Because I found, I've experienced it oftentimes when the enemy attacks you, uh, he's attacking you right in the brain. He's attacking your mind. And for many Christians, here's what the attack can look like. The enemy whispers to you, you're a fake. You're a phony. There is no way you can be a Christian because you're not good enough. You're, you're not living up to the standard that God has for you. There's no way that God can love you. That's, that is one of the primary attacks that the enemy can level upon us. Uh, and, then, and then hear me, here's the interesting thing too, because you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about what spiritual warfare looks like for the Christian, for the follower of Christ, and rightly so. But I want you to understand, if you're a seeker, if you're a person out there that you're saying, well, I don't really, I, I'm not, I, I don't consider myself a Christian, I don't consider myself a Christ follower, I haven't made that decision. Let me tell you, when we talk about spiritual warfare, you're not off the hook because the enemy is just as active in your life and, and, and is, he is just as compelled to uh, destroy you as he is the Christ follower. And so for a, not, for a, a seeker, for a non-Christian, for someone who's never surrendered their life to Christ, 
Guess what? The enemy also attacks your mind too. And he whispers things like this. For some, of, some people, he'll whisper and say, hey, you're, as, you're good enough. You're comfortable. Hey, you know, you, you, were, you go to church. You're just as good as any of those Christian, those Christ follower people. Don't change a thing because you're, you, God, God's a God of love. He'll never judge you. He doesn't judge. Those are the things that the enemy is also whispering to, to a, a non-Christ follower. And then here we are in the middle of this bombardment. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, you know, you could be sitting there hearing this message of, I don't think I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't you know, I, I'm not experiencing uh, the good works. I, I, I want to, I, I love sin more than God sometimes. So the, does that mean I'm not a Christian? Does that mean, does that mean that, that what I'm hearing is the Holy Spirit? Maybe. Or you might be hearing the enemy talking to you too. And then, and then there's times where you're hearing this message of, well, hey, you're okay, be comfortable, stay right where you're at, God's a God of love. And you're saying, well, is that the Holy Spirit or is that the enemy? I, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. It, and, and right now with my illustration, how many people are confused? Because, because that's what I'm trying to make happen. I'm trying to make confusion happen here. Because what I'm saying is this, I'm saying when we start looking at spiritual qualities such as our salvation, it's sometimes confusing, isn't it? I mean, I've been confused. I've been confused in the past about what's going on inside of my heart because it's not like when we give our lives to Jesus that it's not like going and getting a library card, you know, where, where, where a pastor stamps some pa a piece of paper and says, okay, here's your ticket to heaven. Now, just as long as you cling to that, you're okay. I mean, wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy, right? Where I could point to some physical reminder here and say, well, I know I'm okay because look, I got my card. But, but we get all these messages, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm close to God and now I feel distant and, and I'm hearing sometimes that, that, you know, is it the enemy sometimes telling me that, that there's no way I can be a believer because I've sinned in the past and then at other times I'm feeling like I'm okay? What's that all about? And the reality is, is Paul's telling us, telling Christians, put on, put on the helmet of salvation. I believe he's at... I believe this is a warning that the enemy will attack Christians trying to convince them that their salvation is false. And so put that on their head because when their mind is being attacked, they need to know what true salvation is. Having said that, the confusing part, I also know there are a whole lot of people that think they're right with God, but they're putting their, their hopes in false areas. False areas. So now comes the confusing part. You know, well, how do I know I'm in which camp here, Tony? What, what should I think? What should I do? Let me tell you, that the reason why I can, you know, illustrate that or identify with that is because I lived it. I lived it. You know, when, as, a, as a young boy, I lived in just a, a totally irreligious, godless family. I mean, you know, I've said this before from, from this stage that Christmas would come around. I thought Christmas was all about Santa Claus and me getting presents. Uh, Easter, I honestly thought that was a wasted, wasted uh, holiday. I'm like, what's up with that? Because I really don't like 32 hard-boiled eggs, you know, that are painted. After one hard-boiled egg, I'm kind of done, you know. What's so special about, about Easter? Because I thought all it was about was about rabbits and rainy days, you know. And, and, and never heard about the gospel as a kid. And then I go to a Lutheran school, and so I'm, in, I'm all of a sudden now open to the gospel. I'm hearing the gospel for the very first time. But as I'm hearing about the love of Christ and about his love for me and what he's done in my life, I get these mixed messages here because I hear from the Lutheran church that in order for me to be right with God, I need to be baptized and in his church. And so I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I need to get baptized. I need to get baptized. Well, my parents, they take me to a Baptist church because that's what they were before I was born, I go to a Baptist church, a Southern Baptist church, and there I'm hearing all about, not about baptism, I'm hearing about this praying to receive Christ into your life, you know, about asking Jesus to come into your life. And, you know, they're at, have you ever said the sinner's prayer? Have you said the sinner's prayer here? Well, okay, I need to say the sinner's prayer to get right, right? And, and I'm hearing these mixed messages. One pastor who I really respect say, you just need to be baptized. If you are baptized and you go to church and you 
believe these things, then you're right with God. And another pastor saying you need to that I equally love and respect. You need to you need to pray a prayer, and you need to really mean it. So so I pray the prayer. I get baptized. I'm, I'm rocking. I'm going down life now. And then I go into a church that's a highly evangelistic church. I mean, they pride themselves on having more baptisms in a year than any other church in Missouri uh, during that season, during that time. Uh, Part of that culture involved as as a teenager, I'm a teenager at this point, part of that culture involved us every year. We would have these youth evangelists coming. And I mean, there were some in those years, big names, names that maybe some of you don't recognize, maybe some of you do. You know, a guy like by the name of Dawson McAllister, he would come every year and, and, and they would preach to us. And then this would be the steady dose that I would get as a teenager. I would get uh, the idea that if you're worse now than you were when you first became a Christian, there's something wrong. Well, I'm sitting there going, okay, well, I, I first became a Christian at eight. I'm 16 I have a lot of things going through my mind as a 16-year-old that I guarantee I didn't have as an 8-year-old. So, oh, that's a bad sign. Uh, if I'm worse now than I was at 8, you know, oh. And then, and then I'd get this steady dose of, if, okay, it doesn't matter if you prayed that prayer. Did you really mean it? Really, really mean it? And so, you know, a bunch of us would come forward and we'd pray that prayer of salvation, you know, the, the sinner's prayer. We'd pray it again because now I really mean it. I really mean it. Well, you could go back really if you really, you know, play this out. Five minutes later, you could go back to those same people and say, are you sure you really meant it? Or did you maybe just fudge, you know, you only meant 95% of it. Well, you know, be honest with you folks, I'm a teenager. I don't know what's going on in my heart. I mean, I didn't, at that time, I didn't even know if I was really a Turner born to Joanne and Clinton Turner. I kind of had my doubts about that. How could I know what's going on inside of my heart? You know, I had all these doubts and, and just tons of confusion. And here's the thing. I would never, ever confess that or go before the pastors when I would hear statements like, you know, if you have any doubts whatsoever, you need to come forward right now and repray this prayer. But because to some degree, I experienced that as kind of a little bit of emotional and spiritual manipulation. And I kind of recognize that as even as a young 15 and 16 year old. And so, you know, I still, back then I kind of had the personality I had today. And so I recognize, well, if, if I'm feeling like I'm being manipulated, then you know what? I'm just going to do this. <laughs> I'm not doing anything. I'll show you, you know, you're not going to manipulate me. But, but as I refused to act physically, I still had all these doubts in my heart. Right? You know, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And, and then fast forward to I'm 18 years old and I'm a youth pastor now. I'm a youth pastor, a small church in St. Louis, a group of like three teenagers, you know, but I'm still teaching them. I'm still sharing what I know. And, and, and I find myself after a couple of months, uh, it just hits me like a ton of bricks. I'm in drive. I go into my driveway at my home and I just overwhelmed with the sense of just, just, insecurity. And I would just start crying, weeping to God, saying, God, you know, I have these doubts and I just don't know where to turn. I don't know where to turn, God. And I'm just asking you now, would you confirm to either confirm my salvation and let me know that I have the real deal. I'm really your child. And and please do that so that I can move on. I can be beyond this. I don't have to camp here and wonder about my eternal security and will I go to heaven? Will I go to hell? Would you either confirm that in my life or would you show me clearly that I don't have faith in you so that I can surrender for the the real deal? So I can truly surrender my life, God, and I'll do it. When you show me, I will do it. I will give my life to you if you truly show it, not make it a part of an emotional plea, not make it a piece of manipulation from an evangelist trying to pump his numbers up, to be able to brag about how 500 people got saved at this event. Just show me from your word and from, from your spirit what my need is here, God. And I'll, and I'll obey. And I'll obey. And, you know, it was amazing because within 24 hours, within 24 hours, God showed me a passage that I never had seen before. It was in 1 John chapter 5. And I invite you, if you have a copy of scriptures, to turn to 1 John Chapter 5 here. John the Apostle is writing. He's writing towards the end of his life, meaning he's had a lifetime now 
to develop his theology, develop his understanding of what Jesus taught him during those three years of physical ministry with him. And he says, I write these things to you, meaning these things is, he's referring to the book of 1 John. He says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may what? So that you may know that you have eternal life. I came across that within 24 hours of that prayer. Recognizing that when people say, well, you can't really know. How do you know? You, you know, it's all subjective. You're not really going to know until you, until you arrive at Judgment Day. Well, you know, that's bunk. That's junk. That's poor theology. That's, that's not true based on the Word of God. If that's true, then this is a lie. And throw, throw this away. Or if this is true, then that thinking is a lie. And you need to throw that away. You can't have both ends. Because this is declaring through the Apostle John, he's saying, you can know, you can have a security based on what I'm writing here. I'm writing these things to you who believe so that you can know. That passage taught, taught me two things. It taught me, first of all, 2,000 years ago, when Christians were walking around during first generation uh, Christianity, there were a lot of them that had doubts too. Because if they didn't have doubts, why would John say, hey, I'm writing you a whole book so that you can know if you have the security of, of the Spirit in your life, uh, if you have the security of faith in your life? That's the first thing I learned. The second thing I learned was that it is possible to know and have security about your faith. And I realized, based on that, I was like, well, okay, Paul just said I'm, I'm doing some backwards working here. I'm doing some, you know, uh, do, doing some backwards engineering. At the end of the book, he's saying, hey, here's why I wrote the book. So that tells me if I study through the book of 1 John, maybe I could pick up some things here. I could learn some things and to know and, and see what's going on in my life. And so that's what I began doing. I began working and looking uh, through the next couple of months through the book of 1 John, and I discovered very specifically 11 different tests that God says, hey, or that Paul says, hey, or I'm sorry, John. John says, hey, if you're doing this, if you have this attitude, then you're a child of God. If you don't have this attitude, you're not. Uh, he had 11 tests, and today we're going to go through seven of them. We're going to look at seven of them. And, you know, and I apologize up front if you know, you're used to me being a funny guy and telling a bunch of jokes. And here, I'm not going to do that today because this is an issue and this is a subject that is so serious. It is so serious. I mean, I don't want to pastor a church that takes the gospel for granted. I don't want to be a leader at a church in which we're slipshod with someone's faith. And because of that, people come in here and they feel comfortable and they, they are happy with what we're doing. And then when they die, they find themselves cast into the pit of hell because they've never accepted the gospel of Christ and owned it for themselves. I don't want to be a pastor who tells that person that they're okay and everything's good in their life because they show up to church all the time or because they're nice people or because I get along with them, right? I want to be a pastor that proclaims the truth of God's word and then trust the Holy Spirit to do whatever work needs to be done in your life without me manipulating, without me trying to pump numbers up and get people to pray prayers or anything like that. I want to be that kind of pastor. So, so I say that to say that you know we're talking about some deadly serious things today, okay? Deadly serious. And I would ask you not to just allow this information to flow over you, but to listen deeply to these tests. And if you're gutsy enough, if you're sitting there going, you know, I don't necessarily have a security in my life that I should have, I'm going to challenge you to these tests. Because one of the things I've discovered, and I'm working a little bit ahead here, if I have faith in Christ as I dig deep into God's Word, you know what it does? It confirms my salvation. It encourages me. As I dig deep into God's Word, if I find myself going, uh, uh, I'm feeling kind of queasy here. I'm feeling kind of nervous here. Then you know what? That, that I find is also a sign that, okay, what's up with that? The deeper I get into God's word, the more uncertain I am. Well, there's, those are things to pay attention to there. So let's just very quickly, we're going to go through just six tests, six tests today, okay? Um, to, and I'm going to ask you just to apply them to your life and ask the Holy Spirit to reveal his truth to you today. Uh, and then we'll go from there. The first test I discovered is found in 1 John chapter 1. 
1 John 1 here. Just, just asking the question, are you sensitive to your personal sin? Are you sensitive to sin in your life? 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, uh, John's writing, he says, this, message, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. Him is Jesus. God is light. In him there is no darkness. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Now, we need to be very clear that when talking about in God there is light, you know, there is no darkness. We do not walk in darkness if we are, if we are Christ followers. This is not talking about perfectionism. If John meant for you to be morally perfect, he would have used the word per perfect here. But instead, he's talking about walking. It's, a, it's an illustration that was very common in that day in spiritual circles. The idea of walking in light versus walking in darkness is talking about a pattern, a way of living, a way of choosing. And, and, and what John is describing here is he's saying, look, there's some people who claim to receive Christ, and yet if you look at the pattern of their life, it is all dark. Every decision they're choosing to make, they, they do not desire God's word in their life. They do not desire God's righteousness in their life. Rather, they want darkness. They want to live in darkness. He's talking about the trajectory that your life is moving in here. And so the question is, is do I as a Christ follower, I'm not, saying, I'm not asking the question, am I perfect? I'm asking, do I find myself sensitive Especially when God's Holy Spirit begins to convict me over sin in life. Am I sensitive to that? Or do I choose to say, hey, I don't give a rip about that. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Okay? Second question. Are you obedient to Jesus' commands? Are you obedient to the commands that Jesus lays out for us in God's Word? 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. We know that we've come to know Him if we keep his commands. You hear what John's saying? Hey, you, you want to know if you know him? Follow Jesus. Do what he's telling you to do. If Jesus is telling you to do something, you refuse, then you know what? There, there's a problem there. If as you find and, and are experiencing, as you hear the commands of Jesus in your life through his word, through the spirit working in your life, if, if, you, begin, if you obey, there's proof in the pudding there. There is truth there. You, it, it's the idea that we desire to obey the commands of Jesus out of the gratitude that we have because of what he's done for us and not because uh, of some kind of general rule of obedience or, or some kind of Phariseeism of, well, I got to be better to earn my, you know, earn my place with God. No, the idea is I'm obeying the commands of Jesus because he's done so much for me. How can I, how can I not? How can I? He's my Lord. He's my master. He, he's everything to me. How can I not? How can I not be obedient to him? I know that his commands are good for me. I know that he wants the best in my life. How can I not obey him when I hear a clear word and hear a clear command from him? Are you obedient to Jesus' commands? Are you sensitive to your personal sin? Are you obedient to the commands of Jesus? A third test that John exposes in, in the second chapter is, do you reject worldly thinking? Do you reject the dark world? Uh, here's what John writes, 2 verse 15. He says, as soon as I turn to the page, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. It's not in them. Now, it's very clear. We need to understand, because I mentioned earlier that this was a book written later in John's life. That means his theology, his understanding of God is highly developed at this point. So it's very important to understand he's using some words that we would use differently. So, for instance, when we use the word world, many of us are thinking of, you know, the physical world around us. And, and so you hear this passage, do not love the world, and, you know, it could be very easy. We could be very easily tricked into the idea of going, well, you know, I went to the Grand Canyon last year with my kids, and man, I was really cool and beautiful, and I love that. Does that does that mean God's telling me I shouldn't love that because that's in the world? You know, hey, hey, you know, I, I kind of I, I got a new car, and I gotta say, I kind of like it. I kind of like the heated cushions, you know. I kind of like 
I kind of like that crash protection thing that's in there now. I like the idea that I can call someone by just talking over, you know, out in the air. I like those things. Those are cool things, and they're in the world. So if I like that, does that mean that I maybe am lost? No, 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 no. When John is using the word, the word world, he's, he's, that, that's, that's shorthand. That's like a, a note there that the people understood in that day. He, when he says world, he's talking about the philosophy that comes from the pagan mind. The, the, the thoughts and the attitude and then the, the subsequent structure that's built out of philosophy that is devoid of the thoughts of God. The power systems that come because of people seeking their own glorification and trying to deify themselves. That's the world. So yeah, we are talking about systems of government. Yeah, we are talking about systems of money and power and influence. Yeah, we are talking about media. And yeah, we are talking about a lot of the things that our neighbors are saying, hey, you need to live your life in pursuit of these things here. That, that's what we're talking about here. This worldly thinking, this philosophy of doing life that could be summed up this way. Hey, it's all about me because I'm the most important person in this world and I'm going to do whatever pleases me. And I can do good things out there because they please me. I could be the greatest dad in the world, the greatest husband in the world, and you know what? Everyone, even in churches, would say, man, he's doing a great job, but it's ultimately, what's the goal? Well, because it makes me feel good. Well, guess what? That's, that's worldly thinking right there. If, if I'm doing something because it pleases me, it's all about me, that's what we're talking about. That's what John's talking about here in the worldly thinking. And he's saying, hey, you know, if, if you're a Christ follower, you need to reject the worldly thinking. Matter of fact, there's a passage, uh, the same passage written in The Message by Eugene Peterson. He wrote, he wrote The Message, which is a paraphrase of the Bible. I, I asked Cliff to copy this, copy what, what Peterson's... Uh, understanding of chapter 15 or verse 15 is because this is great illustration here this is what peterson how he d describes it he's, he says don't love the world's ways don't love the world's goods love of the world squeezes out love for the father he says he writes to us I, you know i think that's a good definition a good understanding here uh he's basically saying you can't you can't love the way the world uh, the way the world loves you can't love its ways here because, because there's no love of the Father there. So that's the third test. Do you reject worldly thinking? Yes or no? You know, another way for you to go, I don't, I don't know. Okay, someone hurts you. Which, what do you do? Is your goal to hurt them back? Is that your goal in life? Or is your goal to forgive? Wow, Tony, that's, that's pretty hard to do. Well, you know what? That's the way of Christ there. Uh, is your life, is your goal in life to attain as much as you can to have as many toys and as many things, or is it to, to be a steward of what God's entrusted you to, and when you can, you give to others? Uh, is, is that, is that a, a way that you're doing life here? Those are very key things that influence whether or not you're into worldly thinking or not. A fourth test. Are you eagerly awaiting the return of Christ? 1 John chapter 3 Verse 2, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. You know, it's, it's interesting because there's a, some of us that if we talk in a corner away from all the crowd and all the craziness, if we just... Think about, you know, just, just, just having conversation that's unguarded. There's, there's some of us that are sitting back going, you know, when I think of the day that Jesus returns to this earth, I really don't look forward to it. I, it when Jesus returns, it's going to mess my life up. You know, I, I've got things pretty good right now, and I, I don't necessarily want those things changed. I don't want those things changed. Now, again, hear me, hear me clearly, because if, if that's what you're thinking, it could be this. It, it, it could be a couple of things that influence it. It could be that you're saying, you know, I, 
I, I don't want Christ to return because I'm not, I'm not good enough. You know, I've, I've not arrived yet. I, I want to see Jesus when I'm at this point over here and I'm still down here in my life. Well, for you, if that's your thinking, you've not understood grace, okay? Because it's not about us trying to attain a certain level of perfectionism. It's not us trying to get to a certain level of righteousness. Uh, Christ loves you just as much now as he ever will. There is nothing you can do as a Christ follower that will make Jesus any more impressed with you, okay? I want to make that very clear to you. Uh, there's no, and, and, and having said that, there's nothing you can do that may, that's going to make Jesus so ashamed of you that, uh, that he hates you if you're a Christ follower, okay? That's the truth of Scripture here. So if you're sitting there going, well, I just, I just need to get a little bit better before Christ returns, well, you don't understand grace. Uh, and then, and also, there might be this that is driving you thinking. You might say, you know, I'd like to do more in life. You know, I remember when I was a teenager, and our church would would do our Revelation series. You know, our Revelation Day, and you know, almost every teenager dreaded it. We dreaded the idea of Christ returning because, you know, we we would we would uh, let let's just be honest here, okay? We would always be tame to our youth pastor would be like, oh, I want to know, I want to drive. Uh, you know, I haven't driven yet. I want to learn how to drive. And, or some of us say, well, I haven't gone to the prom. I want to go to prom at least once before Christ returns. Those were, all, those were all window dressing for our parents and our pastors. The reality was this. I just, we were all sitting there. At least all the guys were saying, we haven't had sex yet. We want to have sex at least one time before, before Jesus comes back. Okay, that, that's the reality that many of us were thinking Okay, and if you grew up in a, in a Baptist church too, that was your thinking too, guys, whether you, you admit it or not, uh, that's what you're doing. Well, let me tell you, if that's you, if you're sitting there going, okay, hey, it's not sex, Tony, but you know what? I want to see my grandkid raised. I want, to, I want to see a grandkid grow up a little bit before Christ returns. Well, you know, I haven't accomplished this. I haven't written the greatest book in the world yet. I haven't gotten that promotion yet in, job, in my job. Well, if that's you, let me tell you, you haven't understood heaven yet. You don't understand heaven if you're sitting there thinking you're going to do without when Christ returns because the reality is heaven is an active place. You're not just sitting on a cloud playing a harp for eternity. In heaven, I look forward to writing a book that all the population of heaven will buy and read. And I know I'll be able to get it just perfect because I have eternity to work on it. In heaven, you will be able to, to, you will be assigned a task. You will be assigned jobs in which work will not be a drudgery, but it will be a joy. And you'll get to do those things. You'll get to accomplish things in life that right now is only a dream on this side of earth. And so if you're sitting back saying, well, I don't know. I don't know if I, uh, you know, I might be missing out on some things by, by Christ's return. Well, if that's you and you're a believer, you have not gazed into the vision of heaven deeply enough. And I would challenge you to do that. But for some of us, some of us truly dread, dread the idea of Jesus coming back because we dread the idea of Jesus' lordship in our lives. And if that's you, that is a sign that you don't have the real deal in your heart. And so if you find yourself dreading the idea of the return of Jesus, and you can't look upon it with incredible joy and expectation in your life. You're either ignorant, and I'm using that because we're all ignorant about these things, guys. I'm ignorant, okay? So I'm not using that to insult you. I'm saying it's time for you to get unignorant, to get educated about what, those, what, what it truly means to re, for Christ to return. Uh, if, if you're dreading it, you're either ignorant of what the truth is, or you've never had the truth in your life to begin with. Those are the two choices there. And so I ask the question, are you eagerly awaiting the return of Jesus? A fifth question that we can look and delve into to see, is faith the real deal in our lives? Do you love Christians? Do you love other believers in Christ? A.K.A., do you love the church of Jesus Christ? Church is not the building. We know that. You all have come farther. That I, don't, I shouldn't even have to waste my time saying that because we know that we're not, when we talk about the church, we're not talking about a building. We're talking about the people of God. Do you love the church? Do you love other Christians? 1 John chapter 3, verse 10 says, This is how we know who the children of God are. 
We should be leaning to the front of our, you know, if we're struggling with this and going, how do I know who a real Christian is? Well, John just says it. Hey, you want to know who a real Christian is, who a real child of God is? Well, let's lean into this. Here's how we know. Here's how we know. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. Now, hey, I'm not talking, you know, brothers and sisters. And I have four, three brothers. You know what? There is a lot of fighting going on. There is a lot of feuding going on. There is a lot of, you know, words stated. There is a, a lot of mean things done between four brothers, you know? Uh, I'm not talking about perfectionism here, but I'm saying, do you find yourself legitimately, when you see other brothers and sisters in this room, do you sit back and go, I love these people. I love these people. Or do you find yourself looking around going, well, that person disappointed me, and that person offended me, and that person over there, oh, I don't like how they look, and I don't like how that person looks in their jeans, so therefore I, I immediately have something against them. And that person, they think they're better than me, so I'm not going to like them. If that's you, that's more than a personality trait. Pay attention. Pay attention. Is the love of God in your heart when you don't love God's people? A question to ask. And then a sixth test here. Have you experienced the Holy Spirit working within you? Can you say, I've, I've sensed the Holy Spirit doing something in my life. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, chapter 4 here, goes on and says, This is how we know that we live in Him and He in us. He has given us His Spirit. Now, I want to make it real clear because we could all sit back, or most of us, I would guess, most of us, I would guess, would probably sit back and go, Ugh, Tony, I read it about Pentecost and, you know, when the Holy Spirit came down and, and he formed it, the Spirit formed a, a flame on every believer's head. You know, I've never had that happen in my life. Well, you know, understand that was a very specific work that the Spirit did at a very specific time. Uh, some of you are sitting there, you reading about Paul, you know, and how uh, Paul was a boring speaker. Uh, I have a feeling I was a be I'm a better teacher than Paul. You know, that's one of the few things that makes me, you know, have hope in life. Now, he was an awesome writer and evidently did a, did a lot more things than I ever did. But, uh, you know, you realize that he spoke one time and a young man on the second floor fell asleep and fell out of the window and broke his neck. Now, I've had a few people fall asleep when I'm teaching. I, Sunday at Southgate, there was a little old lady right there in my center viewing and she was, she was out cold practically laying on the ground, and she wasn't slain the spirit or anything like that. She was asleep, and I'm sitting there going, wow, what a great preacher I am here. Uh, you know, I've had that happen, but I've never had someone fall down and, and break their neck, and he lays on them. Paul lays on this corpse, and he raises them from the dead, and you're sitting there going, I've never raised anyone from the dead, so I guess I got to check. No, I don't have the spirit working in my life. Well, remember, those are incredible manifestations of the spirit, but more often than not, those manifestations happen, I don't know what the percentage is, 0.005% of the time. Let me tell you, the rest of the time in Scripture, the Spirit is speaking, uh, the, the, God, or the apostles are describing the Spirit's work, like in Galatians chapter 5, when he's saying, look, with the Spirit coming to your life, you will grow things in your life, like the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and mercy. Those things should be developing in your life naturally. That is a sign of the Spirit's work. Not that those things are perfect in me, not that I have perfect love in my life, not that I have perfect joy in my life, but as a person, as I'm continuing to walk down the path with Jesus, I should see those things becoming, uh, to be growing in me, just like a fruit would grow, right? You know, that's why I tell you, hey, you don't like what you see now in me? Hang around a little bit. Just, just give me some time because I'm a lot better today than I was five years ago. And because the Spirit is active in my life, the, the truth is five years from now, whoa, watch out. I'll be so much better than I am today. And I don't say that out of arrogance. I say that because I realize the Holy Spirit is working in me to make me better at the fruits of the Spirit, to grow those things in my life deeper. And so I know the Spirit's working with me because I see those things evidenced as I grow in those areas and experience the Spirit leading me, you know, convicted me of sin, 
convicting me of righteousness, convincing me of the truth of the cross and how it truly is the better way to live. As I experience those things, I can have assurance that the Spirit is working in me because I see His influence making a difference in my life. Not because I'm waiting to slay someone, you know, uh, not that I'm waiting for someone to die and I raise him from the dead. I'm not, not ex- those are not proofs of the Spirit's work in my life. It's these subtle, quiet things. The full is work, seeing the fruit of the Spirit working in our lives. So here's what I would challenge you to do. Today was just meant to kind of prime the pump, okay? You know, if you have doubts in your life, because, because my story, I, I left you kind of right in the middle of it. As I went through this study and spent... About a month working through the book of 1 John, you know what? God's Spirit spoke to me and gave me a confidence of my faith that I had. And, and what I walked away with was understanding that, you know what? I can't tell you the exact moment. I can't tell you the date and the time and what I was wearing and what the temperature was outside. Uh, you know, and just like most of us can't tell us what the details were of our physical birth because we don't remember I don't know when my spiritual birth exactly occurred, but as John MacArthur, Bible teacher from the West Coast, said once, he said, I'm alive today, and I know that to be true. That's all I need to know. doesn't matter. Was it, was it when I got baptized, or was it when I prayed that prayer, that sinner's prayer the first time, or I prayed that sinner's prayer the fourth time? I know I'm alive today. And God, as I, as I went through this book and just dug deep into it, God confirmed through His Spirit His presence in my life. And I challenge you, as you would dig deeper, if you have questions, if this conversation is leading you to have some doubts, leading you to have some questions, dig deeper into the Scripture, specifically 1 John, and He will either confirm His presence or His absence in your life and then respond accordingly. Here's what I can tell you. You know, if you were keeping track and if you said no to two or three of these questions, I would implore you as your friend and as your pastor, pay attention. Pay attention to that. Don't just walk away and say, ah, that's, that's stuff I don't want to talk about because it makes me feel uncomfortable and I'm going to just leave that back here. I'm going to ignore it as fast as I can. Please don't do that. Don't do that. Because we're talking about the eternal destiny of your life, of your person, of your being. And this is so important. If you answer no to two, of the, two or three of these questions, I would dig deep into Scripture. I would have a lot more conversations with people you trust. I'd have a lot more conversations with God. So what, what are you to do based on that? You know, if you're sitting back right now saying, Tony, I, I, you know, I've answered. You, you've convinced me. You know, your spirit, the spirit of, of, of God has convinced me uh, today that I'm living a lie. I've I've not ever put on the, I don't put on the helmet of salvation because I don't have salvation to put on in my life. What's a person to do? Well, I'd say, first of all, understand what is salvation. Salvation is not about being a member of a church. It's not about being a good person. It's not about doing things. It's about coming to a point where you're in a daily surrender to God's leadership in your life. It's when you are daily agreeing with God about the condition of your heart, the condition of your soul, and you're saying, yep, God, I see the sin in me, and I'm, I'm, I'm repenting. I'm asking you to help me turn away from this and to give me something better, to fill into my life, make me, make me different from the inside out. It's when you understand that condition and agree that, and, and, and understand that that doesn't come about because of your work or your personal sacrifice, but because of the work of Jesus Christ by dying on a cross some 2,000 years ago and then rising from the dead, by you understanding that and then you confessing and believing the truth, you will be saved, period. The scripture says if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. So if we believe the truth of of the cross, the truth that God's word declares here, and then we confess it, we say it, we say it out there, then we will be saved. There's no works to do. There's no statements to be memorized. There's no tuition or membership fees that we have to draft out of your bank accounts. If you do those things, you can be saved today. Let's pray. Every head's bowed, every eye's closed, and I'm just, I'm the only one looking around. No one's going to, no one's going to draw attention to you. No one's going to embarrass you, I promise. But just so I know, so I know what we're working with here, 
just, is there anyone that by just raising your hand would say, Tony, I need this now. I, I, I've li been living my life, I've been going to church, I've been doing good things, but you know what? I've never truly, I've never truly invited Jesus to be the Lord of my life. I've never truly taken on salvation and allowed God to change me. If that's you, would you, would you just raise your hand again? I'm not going to, I'm not going to draw any kind of attention to you. I'm not even going to say, oh, I see you in the back or anything like that. I'm just going to just know you're there. If that's you, would you raise your hand? Maybe there's some of us here who, who just says, you know, Tony, I'm, I'm just confused. I, I need to sort some things out in my life. I, I, need, I need some understanding here. If that's, that's you right now, I want to pray for you. Would you... Would you raise your hand just saying, okay, there's just spiritual confusion going on in my life. Okay. And then there's a third group of people. I just want to know if you're in this room. Is there someone here that would say, you know, I've had doubts in my past. I, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've had doubts about my salvation, but I, I can say this today. I, I've heard the Holy Spirit confirming me, confirming my salvation, confirming my walk. If, if that's you, I'd, I'd like to know that you're here. Are, are you in the room saying, you know, I, I had doubts about my salvation, but after hearing this, I, I'm seeing these tests found in Scripture, and I see the truth that God's Word says about my faith. Okay, I see, see those hands. I see those hands. Pray with me. Father, we come before you. We thank you, God. We thank you for the work of the cross, and we thank you knowing that your word promises that we can know that we can have salvation. We can know where our security is. We can know where our eternity will be at. And so would you just, these three different groups of people that we just talked about just now, Lord, would you, would you bless those people and just continue to confirm to those people who discovered, that, who doubted for may, maybe many years, they've doubted their faith and and now they're saying, hey, I'm seeing some of the tests that the Word of God puts out there, and I see God working in me. Would you just confirm them, continue to confirm them, God? Lord, for, for those folks who have questions and are having, having a debate and having discussion in their hearts, would, you, would your Spirit just do a work there and help them discover the truth? These things we pray in your Son's powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet, and if you need to talk to someone... Uh, Christy's over here. I'll be over here. John's over here. You can talk to any of us. Amanda's over here in this corner. Uh, you can talk to one of us. Or you can grab somebody in the connection team uh, outside after service is over.
Amen. So uh, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you will be saved. Helmet of salvation right there. And, you know, Tony said, you know, sometimes uh, it's these hard conversations that we need to have. And he encourages us to have that hard conversation sometimes we have to have with God. And, and you know what? Some of the hardest conversations I've ever had with God have been some of the greatest benchmarks in my life. And so really encourage you to have that conversation. If you have any question, uh, have that conversation with God this week. Connect with Tony this week. Connect with your small group leader this week. Uh, and, and help us, uh, or let us help you, I should say, walk through that. That is one thing in life we need to get clear. All right. So, uh, man, I'll tell you what, if uh, you have some questions, you want to go back and watch this service again because you want you didn't get all five of those uh, things that you need to answer to, you can do that. You can go to our website and uh, www.mynorthbridge.org and you can download this service. You can download any of the other services that have gone on in regards to the series we've been going through. So I encourage you to do that uh, if you can. A couple of reminders I need to make you aware of. Uh, this uh, coming Sunday, we have a couple of things. Um, one, we have our Discovery Northbridge lunch will be next Sunday. Uh, and if you have been with us for a while or kind of wanted to know a little bit more about who we are, this is a lunch you want to be a part of. There's no cost to that at all. Just sign up for it. You can sign up for that on your connection card. Uh, you can drop, again, that connection card over in the giving area or over at the uh, Connection Center. So sign up for that if you want to be a part of that. Uh, also next Saturday, there's a men's breakfast, so all men are invited, 8 o'clock, Golden Corral on North Kansas Expressway. Uh, come be a part of that. Uh, we have uh, the 28th is our serving opportunity that we have at uh, the Harmony House. I'm sorry, 29th. Uh, it's Trunk or Treat. Um, if you haven't signed up for that, you want to help with that, you can still do that. Just sign up for that in the connection area. Also, we're needing some candy for that. So uh, we've got one week to collect the candy, so maybe uh, we're a little behind on letting you know, but we need to collect some candy for that. So uh, bring some candy next Sunday. You can drop that off here. We'll just say drop it off in the connection area. Uh, grab some candy, bring it to church. If, if Maybe if you can't be there to help out, maybe that's your way of uh, helping out for with us. So uh, be a part of that. Also, Frenzies, movie night tonight, correct? And Kid Zone. And Kid Zone. And the time in the bulletin is wrong. It's 6.15, not 6.45. So pay attention to that. Uh, they're meeting up, they're meeting here at the Palace Theater. Meet at the Palace Theater at 6.15. Uh, what else have I forgot? True Love Waits, small group, is uh, continuing to meet on Sunday evenings. Meet up here at 5.45 if they want to ride, okay? And then next weekend is the Trail of Weights uh, retreat. So be praying for our junior high and high school kids as they take a weekend away and, and discuss some pretty important topics in their life. So be praying for that. God bless you. Hope you've been blessed today and been challenged in the same way. You're dismissed.